MDJ Podcast. And, and what does that stand for? Mr. DJ Podcast. What's up, YouTube? Back at you with another video. And we're here with podcast number 16 and I have a very special guest uh, here with me today. Her name is Ayana Chanel. And I guess you could tell people a little bit about yourself before I start to get into it. Hi, everyone. My name is Ayana Chanel. I am a spoken word artist slash poet slash singer slash whatever else you want to put <laughs> on. Um, born and raised in Los Angeles. I don't know what else to say. Yeah, that's that's me. Renaissance woman. Yeah, the rena that's why I called you the other day. I'm like, yo, she's a, she's the modern day Renaissance black woman. You yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> In the flesh. But so basically, I guess just to give people some context, I think I was on Instagram, you know, one day, I guess as far as how we met. And I think I just happened to come across like one of those like beautiful black women pages where they just post like just, you know, attractive black women all day. And then I came across your picture. And then, you know, when I went on your page, I just saw that there were like layers and layers and layers to, you know, who you are. And I was intrigued. That's why I was like, you know, I think I probably spent like a total of like five, five, six minutes just on your page just looking around. I'm like, wow, OK, she, so she's black. She's pretty. Then she does poetry. Then she's an actress. Then she knows the dialogue to the whiz and then this, this, and that. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm like, let me let me have a conversation with her. I was like, you know, let me let me go ahead and talk to her. And then just as we were talking, I was like, well, you know what? We might as well just um, you know, do a podcast episode and you know, pretty much see where it goes. But so one of the things that I, I did want to ask you is because I write poetry myself, and I think the 12th episode of my podcast, I had actually um had two of my other poetry friends that I know through Instagram, and we came on and we talked about poetry, but one of them does spoken word, but I think there's a difference between what he does and what you do. And I think there's a, like a lot of anxiety on my part when I think about doing things like that, which is kind of strange because I'm an actor and I'm used to performing in front of people. But I think for you to pretty much kind of share that side to your mind in front of a group of people, because I, I think it's I think it's different when you're acting, you're reading and performing essentially somebody else's words and you're not even really yourself you're portraying a character so it's not even really you it's the character but when it's you know spoken word it's like the the deeper innermost parts of your mind and the way that you feel about different things whether it's love society trauma you know whatever so what i was going to ask you was what is it like what goes into that you know mm -hmm. like how like just go ahead like so how did you get into spoken word and What's it like for you to, you know, perform in front of people? And if there is a difference between like just writing, you know, poetry and then just kind of that being it versus, you know, what you do. Absolutely. Um, so first things first, I started doing poetry in high school in ninth grade. Uh, well, I I was intrigued in the art form in eighth grade. We did like, you know, schools do poetry units where you like write a poem and your English teacher is like, okay, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. But my English teacher sort of went off of the curriculum that we had and made it more modern. So we were able to engage with the art form a little more. Mm -hmm. And so instead of doing like Shakespearean units where you're like writing sonnets and you're supposed to use old English and, you know, it's not really something that you can relate to. Um, my teacher like had us write real modern pieces and I didn't think much of it, but he did mention like that my work was very good and that um, there is a career out there for writing if I wanted to pursue that. Um, I was in eighth grade, so I didn't really like, you know, process right, like, right, oh, right. this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be a writer now, no. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, so I went to a performing arts high school and I was there for dance and theater. Wow, must be nice. That must be nice. I, I I wish I could say the same. I wish I could say the same, but not can see my back. It was pretty awesome, <laughs> but the theater program I didn't enjoy it at all. Like I love acting. I love being a part of theater, um, but the teachers were like those teachers that you can tell they gave up a long time ago on you know trying to make a difference, trying to be influential and teach. Right. It was sort of sad to see because they would talk about it sometimes. And then that just made the kids disconnect. So I was like, I don't think I want to stay in the theater program. I need to find something else to do at the school because based on the way our curriculum was set up, you had to be a part of a certain amount of arts classes in order to like say that you were in the dance program, say that mm -hmm. you were in the dance program. 
Um, and I was talking to my English teacher about it. And she was like, well, we have a poetry team. Like, I don't know if you want to do that, but that should be fun. And so I auditioned for the poetry team um, in ninth grade and I got in and it was like a whole new world opened up and that's where i learned the difference between poetry and like spoken word and slam and all of these things right um, and it def it absolutely aligns with what you were saying like when you're acting even if you resonate with the character even if you resonate with what's being said ultimately it's someone else's words so there's a certain amount of disconnect right that you can have in what you say you know mm -hmm. like you can play a racist or a something as an actor and people will know like yeah it's your, your role you know mm -hmm. um, but with your poetry like it's your words even if you are talented enough to i've seen some spoken word artists like step outside of their comfort zone and do something like that to where they portray a character that they know typically they aren't comfortable with right. um in order right. to like um, prove a point or you know bring an argument to the table and things like that um, but at the end of the day it's your words and so there's automatically something so vulnerable about getting up on stage and saying anything in the spoken word spoken word world um, and I sort of just really liked that I liked or I still do I don't know I'm using past tense I like mm -hmm. going on stage and feeling almost like stripped down to my raw self, my my beliefs, my core values and being able to say it and knowing that when I say it, you're gonna know that it's me, like, you know? Right. Um, and then with that, like, of course I love acting with other people's words, but when it's your writing, you get to say whatever the hell you want. You get to make it as mm -hmm. artistic or pull from references that only maybe you and some people would know Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what's cool about it too. Not only when you're in the spoken word, spoken word scene, are you sort of an actor, but you're also the writer. You're also the director. You're also the the you know you're everything right. that goes into the pieces. Right. And I think that's what's the most fun for me about being in that world. So all right, so like I, I can only speak for myself. So. For me, and I, I kind of look at people that I see on Instagram a lot, like they kind of write, like I, I can only, it, for what it seems to me is like they write 10 poems a day. I can't do that. Like I, yeah, like, so the last poem, well, not the last poem that I wrote, but basically I make poetry short films on my YouTube channel because mm -hmm. I figured it's kind of whack to just write a poem and then like close the notebook and then that's pretty much it. So mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to start making things that accompany the way that I feel and kind of what went into it. The last, the last one that I made is called Void. And essentially it was kind of, I was going through a sort of like dilemma, which is basically there was just like a void within myself. And I couldn't really understand what it was, why it was, and why I was kind of doing some of the things that I was doing. And basically that's pretty much where my poetry starts. It's, it's like, I'm, I ask, I pose a question to myself and then I answer that question, you know, existentially or rhetorically in the form of a question uh, or in the form of an answer or in the form of a poem. <laughs> um, so with that said, what's your process like in terms of writing um, a poem with the intention of it being performed live? Because like I said, I, I don't think I could ever do that, at least not right now. I think I've, I've written pieces that could be performed, but I think just just the the I, I guess you could say fear of being judged or not being accepted or perceived is pretty much why I would probably never put myself in that line of fire but you got yeah 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 and then definitely understand that I had to break past the point of like the fear of being judged um in which I still like get nervous about it be like oh what if they don't like it what if da, 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 da. but now I'd be like if they don't like it then it wasn't for them it's not their mm -hmm. message like it sometimes and sometimes people have said to me like at first I did not like this poem but then I heard it like two years later and I was like whoa like new meaning I understand it now and I'll be like see y'all he was just sleep like it it needed time to process wait somebody told you that they didn't like your poem mm -hmm. really like so you went and performed it somewhere and then somebody was just like oh I don't like your poem 
Well, because especially out here in the Los Angeles scene, the spoken word community is so tightly knit that some people I've known like since I was like 16, 15, 14, performing my spoken word pieces. Um, and I've seen them at like various open mics. Like at some point I was seeing certain people like three times a week performing at different mics. Right. Uh, so it was like, eventually you just got accustomed to hearing some people's, like I can perform some other people's pieces right now that I just know off the bat because mm -hmm. I've seen them perform it so much. Right. Um, but that being said, like some some of the poems I've heard, they are tired. I'd be like, please stop performing that piece. It's old. Um, let, let, me, let me ask you something real quick. I'm sorry. Let me, let me ask you because I'm like really curious. So what, all right, for me, I, I just feel like what's not to like about someone else's poem? Like, so explain to me like the rationale that goes into that. So that way, if I ever do do that, I'll know like people's mentality. So that way I'll be best prepared. But like, what? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like music. Like everyone is so different, right? It's just like movies. Like some movies are great, but some people just aren't going to like them. And that's okay. Right. Um, a lot of my poems are satirical. I, I think I'm funny. I like to be funny. Um, I think it's funny to like joke about things that you wouldn't normally joke about and people know that it's like borderline like not okay to say that. Um, one of my pieces is literally about like cannibalism. It's about eating someone and it's it's about eating the rich so but it gets like mm. into the details of like eating a rich person like they right. just hopped out the new wit and you over there biting their leg off. Um, and that wasn't the piece that someone didn't like. The piece that someone didn't like um, was about assault, but it starts with the perspective of the assaulter and okay. like just the disgusting mindset. Um, but so it, I had to do one of those pieces where I had to step into someone's mind and be like, okay, if what would someone who's like an abuser say? They're manipulative. Mm. They're um inconsiderate they're ignorant like you know so i had to like really sit and think like damn what would someone say if you tried to confront them about like being an assaulter and so i had to say some of those things in order to get to the side of being assaulted right mm -hmm. and speak on speak on the other side and be like do you hear how this sounds it's right. disgusting don't be like that um and that was the piece that one of one of my longtime friends who was a poet was like that piece used to disgust me. I hated it. I couldn't like, it used wow. to make me mad because she resonated so strongly with, you know, the disgust of- So it was good then. That means it, it was, was good. It was good that she didn't <laughs> like it. But at the same time, she walked up to me and she was like, I hate that piece. I don't like it. Well, well, but, but I, I think, like you said, you juxtapose the mentality and the words of the assaulter to the person who's assaulted. So of course, listening to those things is going to trigger people in a certain way. As like, I, I've kind of, you know, um, just knowing the people that I know on Instagram that do poetry, it's like a trigger warning. So it's like, yeah. you might be triggered by some of the things that are said, but I feel like, I think how she felt mm -hmm. was, you know, disgust, but I don't feel like that had, had anything to do with the poem itself. If you get what I'm saying, oh, like, there's like a separation. So it's like, yeah. it's how you felt about what was said, not the de like the poem, because well, I feel like if she felt like that, then it served its purpose. I, that's what I was about to say. It can yeah. be the poem too, but then I just know my point got across, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes that's going to happen to where, or I have a lot of Black poems, and of course, you know, people who are non-Black, they're, they're not, not always going to It's not going to resonate. That's not right. my problem, right? That's not my problem. Mm -hmm. But so then it becomes a thing of like, even if someone doesn't like your piece, that doesn't change the fact that it's your piece and it's your poem and you know what you're trying to say. Unless it's some like ridiculously like bad things, right? Like we can all agree like, like there profanity? Are some... <laughs> no, um, profanity is cool. Like, yeah, maybe like slurs. Slurs and you're not a part of that demographic and you over right. here just like, off the fly, just you know. throwing N-words and- Exactly, and, yeah, you yeah, a white yeah. dude throwing N-words on the stage left and right, left and right. Don't do that. Yeah. But, <laughs> but like otherwise, sometimes it's just gonna take people a minute to get used to your piece. Sometimes yeah. it's gonna be like they don't resonate with it, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Like, because at the end of the day, if your piece serves the purpose of healing you and telling your story, 
Yeah, I, I think I think it's it's because like for me, my poetry is so personal that I couldn't even really put it out there for somebody mm -hmm. to just so that's like like so from the videos that I've seen of you, it's like you're literally literally like in front of people, like you're performing. You're it's like you and then there's them. And at any point, like, do you like find yourself like kind of looking for reactions? So like, all right, so I performed a play back in uh, uh, December and basically there were humorous lines or dialogue to you know, my character. And there are, there are nights where like the crowd is just eating it up. And then there's other nights that like no one even reacts. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But with spoken word, it's like, I, I couldn't help but feel like sort of looking to people to see if they're reacting, like if they're nodding or if they're blank or if they're shaking their head like so it, it so I, I could like in my head worst case scenario is like if I were to go and perform it and not get any reaction at all I'm like I'm not doing this shit again <laughs> for me like y'all I'm gonna just be real I ain't gonna do this shit again like if y'all not if, if y'all not gonna connect to it the way that I feel like I am so it's like why you know what I'm saying like why would I even expose that 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 side of myself because it's like really like I because I started really writing poetry because kind of like you um, I took a creative writing class. And then once we got into the poetry unit, essentially it just stuck, but I was in a relationship and then I used to like, you know, you, you make mistakes and, you know, she might block your number. So you gotta, you gotta send the email. And then I used to just send like six, seven paragraph emails about how sorry I was and how I was feeling and all of that. And then like, you know, she started to say like, oh, like you really have like a way with words and things like that. And then so that's really, you know, where it started from. So I tend to write about the way that I feel, you know, mm -hmm. um, I do have like a couple, I think like maybe two or three um, poems that are about like what's going on in society with black people. I think one of them is called Black Trauma or Black Minds. Even one of them is like I couldn't help. But so what happened was this time around this time last year. I wanted to write about what's been going on. It's like you, you look on the internet and then it's just the same things over and over and over again. And around that same time, I got into Malcolm X. So I was watching a lot of his speeches, a lot of his interviews. And then I saw Spike Lee's film, you know, for the first time. And then that poetry idea, that concept evolved into um, a short film that I made called Questions for Malcolm X. And it's an interview between myself and Malcolm X. So I'm asking him modern contemporary questions and then he's answering them like pretty much as if he was here right now. Um, but I kind of forgot where I was going with it. <laughs> so what did I ask you in the first place? I forgot. Uh, I, oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you find yourself at any point um, looking for people's reactions or do you just kind of like go up there, say it and leave it? Um, a mix of both. Like. And have you ever regretted performing it? Like, have you ever? No, I've like, never regretted performing. Really? Piece. Okay. Okay. Um, there are times when, so I say a mix of both for this reason. There are times when I've written pieces, and of course, like your first time performing a piece, you don't know how the audience is going to react, like at all. It's a new clean slate. Um, and I expected them to click with one line, but they clicked with another, and then like things like that, um, where it's like, oh, you guys laughed here, but this was where the punchline was oh, you guys clapped here, but you missed the next line or the line yeah. before, right? Um, and then sometimes there, after experiencing that so many times, I was just like, you write your pieces and you have moments where you feel like these are the best, but ultimately going back to the, people are going to resonate differently, right? So things are going to hit and sound, even, even if it's the same wording, things are going to sound different in people's heads, mm -hmm. sound different in people's ears, what they pick up from your pieces. So I expect a reaction of some sort. I don't know if it's going to be laughter, crying, anger, da 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 da, da. I've right. had people cry to my pieces that were like not pieces I would expect people to cry to. Really? Um, wow. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Um, Damn. And good tears, good tears, of course, but it was still nevertheless mm. like, you cried to that piece? Like, what? Yeah. Um, what was it about? Like, the, that, like, the so... Piece? Yeah, um, yeah. So like one of them, I guess, if you could. So yeah, I have some I have some really good pieces that I would expect people to cry to. There's one about like a response to Maya Angelou's Still Rise, where it's like continuing on. We are still rising to this day. People have cried to that one, yada, yada, yada. But I have this poem called 
um, Simply Wholesome, which is a like black supermarket that's LA resident. Um, it's been here since like 1980 or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it was like a Trader Joe's before Trader Joe's existed and it was it is black owned. Um, and basically the poem is about like how I would burn down every McDonald's and replace each McDonald's with a Simply Wholesome. And the lady came up to me after and she was like, you moved me to tears. Like what? I was crying. Da, 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 da. And I was like, girl, I was literally talking about like a, assaulting Ronald McDonald. That made you cry? What? I, I'm, I'm just, my mind is kind of blown and it almost kind of makes me want to hear it. <laughs> but <laughs> it's like, really it's one of my favorites. It's yeah, my favorites. because I mean, it, I, I think I can't really, really perceive it without hearing it, but it's like, I, like maybe the way that you said it, like your delivery, because I know that's like a big part of like, you know, spoken word and like yeah. slam poetry and those things is how you deliver it because you're performing it, you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like I'd be reading it. You know, mm-hmm. I write from the aspect of, of, you know, just for it to be read or heard. But like, I, I think I have two um, uh, poems that I wrote. One, the first one was called, Can You See Me? And that one, you know, it was more so to be heard rather rather than read, because I feel like sometimes my voice can get in the way of what's being what what, what I wrote. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I, my, my cousin was like, oh, you know, you should do spoken word. But I'm like, yeah, sometimes I want you to read it in whatever voice you hear it in. It might be your voice. It might be mine. It might be someone else's voice. You know what I'm saying? And the other one was called um, 219. And I feel like that one maybe you know, somebody would probably find it, you know, like, uh, like, cause they're like sweet, like both of them, like basically 219 was about a woman that I had a dream about, you know, because I've never had, you know, a woman in my entire life that was just my friend. So the woman that I had a dream about was basically my first friend. And then the other one was pretty much, um, can you see me is basically, could you see me in a different light? Although, you know, we're going our separate ways. So it's like, yeah, like our relationship ended, but I don't have to hate you for that essentially. Um, but I don't know if you have that poem on hand. And I could I could hear it. <laughs> uh, the simply the simply wholesome one poem. one of them. I, I don't know. I, I I just I'm so curious. I, it's like I, like I don't think we can really do this without me hearing at least one. And then That's I'll kind of I'll do you one and I'll I'll read one or something like that. I'll have I have it. I of course I have it. Um, I, yeah, I'm I'm very curious. I'm very curious. <laughs> but yeah, I mean I I guess it could be how I read it. Like I read it the same every time. But, you know, th- like I was saying, you never know how people are going to react. So it was yeah. like a shocker that she came up to me talking about she was crying. But I was like, if you felt that serious about my words or how I performed or whatever, then I'll take it, you know? Wow. Um, yeah, so this is Simply Wholesome. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now that I've just said someone <laughs> cried, to me, it's going to be really funny to read. Okay. Not good. I'm going to burn the nearest McDonald's down. There are 13,837 McDonald's in the United States alone. This is more than all of the Trader Joe's and Costco's combined. California has over 1,000 and 14 of those McDonald's are within a five mile radius of my own house. I passed seven of them in order to get to the closest Albertsons and I'm sick of the mass marketing. Hearing, turning corners to hear, ba-da-ba-ba-ba, I hate it. I would just like a salad where I don't have to question if the lettuce is a real vegetable. I'm going to burn down the nearest McDonald's because there is no reason why you can find a drive through before a farmer's market. Before we know it, Ralph's will be replaced with McRibs and Big Macs, no more food for less. The only option is fast and fake. They sell boxes of crap for $2 and call it dinner. So yes, I'm going to burn down the nearest McDonald's and the next closest one because it's literally right across the street. See, I live in a place where folks can't afford fresh food and fast don't give a fuck. So they'll give them kids meals for just a few bucks with all five food groups to grow up nice and strong. Byproduct, French fries, Coca-Cola, McFlurries, and slop. With malpractice malnutrition, my people won't even be able to fight a fair battle because we are already losing to heart attacks, high cholesterol, high blood sugar. So I will be the one to start the war. I will send over salted sugar, frozen lard, soaked French flies, flinging into the air. I will launch McNugget mystery meats into Ronald McDonald's face and pour large fountain drinks to, down the streets to wash out my tracks. Block by block, I will cleanse us of forever broken ice cream machines and supersized servings. I will burn down all 13,837 McDonald's and replace each one of them with the Simply Wholesome. 
<laughs> that was dope. That was dope. And so, and if forgive me if you didn't already say that already. So, what what was what was the impetus for you writing that again? Um, I think you said that, but I just just so I could kind of you know like just nail in the coffin, like you know hearing that. multiple things like i live in not like the best part of los angeles so there's food deserts over here we got like a bunch of fast foods there's no you know farmers like i said there's no farmers markets there's not many healthy alternatives but the school i went to which was in culver city um which is maybe 30 minutes away on a good day um has all like you won't find a mcdonald's over there like mm -hmm. they have you know, Trader Joe's, they have farmers markets, they have Albertsons, they have um, all of these fresh, readily available foods for them. And I was sort of like sick of it because Simply Wholesome is like the only, one is black owned and it's been around, like I said, longer than Trader Joe's, um, but it wasn't talked about. It didn't get its credit or deserve mm -hmm. or its hype that it should have, um, but it's still here, you know, trying to feed our community and things of that nature. And I was sort of like sick of that. I was like, yeah, yeah. Like the healthier options and alternatives are not in abundance. And that, that is true. A lot of people don't take their, um, their health seriously. Um, I mean, even me, it's like, I went vegan, you know, for seven months, you know, last year, just because it's just like, you have to do things, you know, differently. And, and honestly, it's like, when I told people that they were, their reaction was almost as if like, going vegan and not eating meat was like the unhealthy thing to do. It's like, <laughs> if you really know like how your body processes meat, you probably wouldn't want to eat it either. The only reason why I like, I, like I eat it now is because like, you know, I'm in the gym and I'm bulking. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to like put on size and muscle, you know, with just like a fixed amount of calories that you're getting on a vegan diet. But eventually I'll go back to it because the, the energy is just different. It's like, you know how like you eat, you get the itis, you kind of want to go to sleep and all of that. When you're vegan, you don't get that at all. Like you, you actually, your food actually gives you energy. So it's like, you'll eat a big meal and then you're just ready to go. There is no lethargy, you know what I'm saying? But uh, that's cool. Wow. Like, yeah, I, I could see why um, maybe, I think maybe she probably has a hard time, you know, um, choosing healthier options, or maybe she feels the same way that like, it's it's refreshing to hear someone else kind of you know share that same mindset wow i didn't even think i probably would never even thought of that <laughs> yeah yeah so it was just like back to the reactions thing um and I, there is this fear like what if no one ever react what if no one like resonates with something what if no one gets it da, da, da. that has never happened to me i've never witnessed it happen realistically you have to probably go up go up there and literally sing like twinkle twinkle little star for someone to not react to and you know depending on how you sing twinkle twinkle little star someone might have been like man like you could sing twinkle twinkle right. <laughs> i've never seen someone not react to a piece it might be a negative reaction it might be a positive reaction it might be something you didn't expect but the fear of no one in the room not getting it it's, yeah. that's literally just all up here and it takes a lot of time to break past that because I used to get that a lot especially because I was performing when I first started with a bunch of high schoolers like it's never fun to do anything in front of a bunch of high schoolers right they're so mm. judgmental and yeah. kids. um but after doing some of my pieces I did one piece in like 10th grade about um the relationship between me and my father and I expected like no one to talk about it, no one to walk up to me, like no responses. People were coming up to me like hurt, like I never would have known. I have that relationship with my grandpa, my mother, my uncle, da 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 da. It sucks. Right. I know all of these, and so like sometimes it'll be the people you least expect to for it to resonate with, for it to do the most impact with. Yeah. Um, that's not to say you got to get on the stage because I understand some there are some pieces I've written that I will never read in front of people. How did you get into collecting all these vinyl records and listening to to music that yeah. is even way before my time? Well, um, a few things, actually. So one of the reasons that my family was I don't know if I had said this while we were recording. One of the reasons my family owns so much land is that my. 
my grandfather and my great uncles, great aunties, all of that, mm -hmm. um, were very big in the Los Angeles music industry in the 70s and 80s and things of that nature. My uncle played for a band called LTD. Um, they made that song. Holding on. Oh, holding on. Every time I turn around, I'm back in love. Mm -hmm. Love ballad. He played the bass in that band. Okay. My uncle Rico was a radio talk show host um, all throughout the 80s and 90s. He actually um, was the radio host that was talking during the Rodney King riots through all of LA. So mm -hmm. he was very prominent um, back then. And he owned a comedy club that was like, wow. Well, yeah, so a lot of comedians that we know now um, were like youngins at his club. Um, but so that being said, we have slash had a lot of popularity, wealth, I guess you could say. Um, so my uncle, who was in the band, um, my sister and I, when my mom was like at work, we would spend our days with him and my aunt. Um, because she would get off work at like five or six, right? But school gets out at three. Mm -hmm. And why would a babysitter when auntie and uncle live right across the street? Um, so they would pick us up and they used to do that from my like third grade year to around my seventh or eighth grade year. Um, and he used to collect vinyls, um, but he passed. And so that music went to me, some mm. of the books, me, flyers, um, posters, things of that nature. And I was like, I'm gonna keep collecting. Like this is his, you know, legacy that he left to me. Mm -hmm. um, and cool. when I told my grandparents that I was collecting, they were like, we got vinyls, take some of ours, you know? Must be um, nice. <laughs> and yeah, it was actually really cool. So like the base of my collection, I wanna say, I think I have around a hundred and I haven't counted since last time. So it's like 150, 160 vinyls. Um, but the first 50 came from them. Like mm. they're great. So like Stevie Wonder songs on the key of life came from them. I have Michael Jackson's Thriller down here. Mm -hmm. I, have I got it down down there too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that collection all started with my uncle. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, I think, I think for me, um, just hearing people talk about back in the day going and getting records, you know, cause like now we don't, we don't even consume music the same way that like they did, you know, back yeah. then it's like back then they would go to like tower records or whatever, you know, stories they had back then get, get the record, come home, play it, you know, sit with everybody, listen to the whole thing all the way through. Now it's like, Oh, it's on Spotify. It's on Apple music. And then even me, like now it's like, I don't like, let's say if like Kendrick, or Kanye come out with an album or something like that, I'll probably like cherry pick the songs that I like and then pretty much ignore the rest of it. <laughs> I'm always like that. But, um, you know, with, with the, with the records that like I have here, it's like, I want to get all the records that like mean something to me at, you know, in some way, shape or form, whether it's like, you know, new edition or cool in the game, the Jacksons or, you know, the time, things like that. It's like, so when I have like the full display, because ultimately I want to have like a like a big old display of all my records and people are like, oh, well, why is this there? And I could tell you exactly why it's there and what it meant to me, you know, when I actually, you know, send the who, what, where, when and why of why I have all my um, vinyls and things like that. So that, that's pretty cool. I don't know. You don't meet too many people that say, oh, hey, I have vinyls and I collect vinyls and we, we brag about it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. You know, you don't get that a lot. But um yeah, so um, I want to say definitely I appreciate the time coming on the podcast and things like that and sharing, you know, a bit of your afternoon, you know, with me. You know, this was super cool, very informative for me. If you're in L.A., hit me up, come out, <laughs> read some of my spoken word. Um, I have a book releasing September 24th, Little Black Poetry Book. It's my first full collection of poetry. So if you would like to read like that or know about that, then, of course, also find me i guess um <laughs> and yeah thank you so much for allowing me to come on and just talking with me it's been fun oh cool cool and i will see y'all on the next one peace